the preacher for the Wadsworth Church of Christ here in Wadsworth, Ohio. Glad you can tune into the program and be with us today. Today we're talking about uh, a holiday that we just celebrated called uh, Labor Day. I always find it sort of interesting that you know we celebrate Labor Day by taking the day off from work, but, uh, but I just find that sort of intriguing. The holiday was actually started uh, by the Central Labor Union. It's interesting that uh, they worked on that back in 1882. And the federal government made it a national holiday in 1894. Uh, they selected September, some people say, to have a holiday in between Independence Day and Thanksgiving. And we have a lot of different little ways that we celebrate or we observe it or things that we do or Labor Day marks certain things uh, on our calendar. Uh, for example, I can remember growing up, it was, you know, you weren't supposed to wear white anymore after Labor Day. Uh, and if you go back even further after that, or before that, it says that uh, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, you were supposed to wear a straw hat, but after Labor Day, you weren't supposed to do that. You were supposed to wear a felt hat. Uh, but uh, we don't wear those kinds of hats very often anymore. And you know, holidays change, and Labor Day has its own series of changes. Uh, there is a time, and, and perhaps still is, when uh, prominent figures would make speeches on Labor Day. Uh, obviously, we know about that in the campaign season that people are making speeches, and sometimes Labor Day is a day of, that people make speeches in our communities. You know, it's also a time where people, you know, they celebrate the, you know, the coming end of summer. Maybe they get one more family getaway, one more cookout. Some people look at it as the beginning of uh, football season, and they're excited about that. And we need to realize that, you know, there's, you know, labor is important. You know, we're supposed to work. You know, and that's our topic for the day. We'll work till. And you know, it's important that we notice that, you know, that we're workers. Um, it, not just you know, Americans, but all of us. We're all supposed to be workers. But a lot of people are out of work today. If you take a look at this chart, uh, this is a chart that uh, shows you uh, the unemployment rate on the line chart. And then the bars there, uh, the vertical bars, the gray ones are recessions. And if you notice, you know, we are in a, you know, we're just come out of recession but the unemployment rate just skyrocketed. And a lot of people are out of work. And, and, and indeed our sympathies are with them as they look for work. And, and we need to be careful. I hear a lot of things, you know, pro and con on both sides of the political aisle. But we need to be careful with the size of our brush when we brush generalities. You know, the idea that, you know, I, I read articles, you know, being unemployed for a while myself during that period of time. I read articles where they said, well, the only people that are worth hiring now are the people that have jobs. Well, I didn't really appreciate that at all because I had just been laid off. And I'm like, well, how could they say that? So it's, it's, it's easy to become discouraged uh, when you're looking for work. And we, and we just have to keep trying and hope that the economy works better and that people will be able to get back to work because I know that's pressing on a lot of people's minds. And take a look at this next chart about food stamps. You know, food stamps are at the highest level in our nation's history. You know, and when I studied economics, they used a, a phrase for these uh, contractions, is what they call it, when the economy contracts and, and the growth diminishes, and when growth diminishes, unemployment goes up. Well, for a lot of people, especially this last recession we were in, it wasn't a, just a contraction, it was a subtraction. People lost their jobs, people lost their houses, people uh, it was a big loss for a lot of people, and people are still struggling with that. And we need to recognize that, you know, a lot of people are out of work. They've been out of work for a long time, and that they need help. And as neighbors, we need to do all that we can to try to help people to the best of our ability. And one of the ways that we do that, uh, some of us, you know, we work at jobs, we pay taxes, and we provide uh, these types of assistance for people. And, you know, and people say, well, there's people who abuse the system. Well, we all know that. There are people that do that, and there always will be. But just because there are people that abuse the system does not mean everybody does. And it doesn't mean that we can know which one's doing that and which one's not. And it's important that we remember that when we're talking to people to be sensitive to the fact that people are looking for work. They want to work. They want to provide for their families. But let's take a look at in a second what the Bible says about work. Where did work come from? Well, you've got to go back to the Garden of Eden. God created the, uh, the idea of work in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. If you look in Genesis 2 and verse 8, it tells you that God planted a garden and then he put man there. And all man had to do in Genesis 2 verse 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. He didn't even have to plant it. All he had to do was take care of it. So, you know, work was created by God 
for the benefit of man. God intended that man would work, that people would work. You know, God worked. He created the world. Jesus worked. He was there in the creation. He did things with the creation as well. The Holy Spirit worked. They were all working. They're still working. They And we are God's creation, and God created work for us. So there's benefit to work. But where did hard work come from? You know, we, um, we talk about, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, all they had to do is take care of the garden. And remember, all they had to do is take care of it and then not eat of this tree. Don't eat of the fruit of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of the uh, fruit, the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't eat of that. And that's all they had to do. Just don't eat it. And, then, you know, and enjoy the garden. And they, they failed. And we often sort of joke sometimes, people do, about, you know, when uh, women have labor and all that, when they're going through childbearing, about the labor they have. And sometimes you'll hear a woman say, well, thanks a lot, Eve. Because we talk about, you know, one of the, one of the punishments that they had was that women would have uh, pain during childbirth. And that goes back to their sin into the garden. But Adam was punished too. Uh, take a look at Genesis chapter 3, 17 through 19. It says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from which to, of the tree from which I command you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Here in this lesson I want to talk about two, two uh, parties we work for. You know, sometimes you'll hear people use the expression when they go to work, I'm going to go work for the man. I'm going to work for the man. Well, they talk about a boss or an employer or a company or something like that. They're going to go work for the man. And then the second one I want to talk about is working for the Lord. And we need to be able to do, to do both. The Lord expects those who are able to work um, to do so. He expects that. Uh, working for the man. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Notice what it says. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. And, you know, you come across people like that. We talk about people that are, you know, they call them freeloaders, whatever they want to term them. And those people are real. We have that in our society. I remember listening to a radio program, and uh, the guy's name was Nick. He called in. He told the story about uh, some guy had a sign on the exit of the interstate. He says, the sign said, I'll work for food. And so he rolled down the window, and he talked to the guy, and he said, hey, I'll tell you what. He said, why don't you come home with me? I'll feed you. And then I got some wood for you to cut. It'll, it's an all-day job. And then when you're done, you, you can clean up, and, and I'll feed you again, and I'll pay you for the day. You know what the guy said? I can't repeat what the guy said. But he wasn't, he wasn't interested in the work. No, what he said after this expletive uh, that he issued, he said that uh, you know, once it's going to be $20. In other words, I'm not willing to work. I just want the money. You know, there's people like that. We, we all are aware of that. And you know what this guy did? This guy quoted this passage that Paul said, if a man will not work, neither should he. The man was able to work. He would not do so. And the man wasn't obligated to give him money. If he's not willing to do that, we are expected to work, and God frowns on those who refuse to do so when they have the opportunity. You know, if they have the opportunity and they don't do it, and they're not providing for their family, God is even stronger in His condemnation of that. Notice what He says in First Timothy chapter five and verse eight. He says, "But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever." Now, keep in mind. He's not talking about people who are unable to. He's not, talking about, he's not talking about the people that can't find opportunity to. No, we're very sensitive to that. No, we're talking about people who have the opportunity and the ability but refuse to. And then they have a family, and they still refuse to do it. Well, God is very strong in his word in condemnation about those kinds of people. You know, but we also, you know, we also have another problem in our society, it seems, it seems like people spend so much time working for the man that they forget about working for the Lord. You know, King Solomon was viewed as one of the wisest men who ever lived. And that's one of the things he warned about. He warned about the futility of working so hard for the man that you don't work for the Lord. Notice what he warns about in the book of Ecclesiastes. He gives this warning. We'll skip this next slide. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. 
He says, For I have hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I have toiled, and in which I have also shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. So Solomon is pointing out here, there is a danger that you could work for the man too much. Now you tell your employer that, and they're going to say, oh no, you work for me all your waking hours. You're on call, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, seven days, you know, all 365 days a year. You're thinking about our company. If you're not working for the company, you're still thinking about the company. Yeah, that's the way employers are sometimes. Not all of them, but sometimes they're that way. And, but we have to realize that, you know, we have obligations. We have obligations, like for myself. I am a father, and I'm a husband. I'm a preacher. I work for a congregation. I have obligations to the Lord. And, and you have similar type of obligations in your world as well. And we need to be aware of that. But, uh, you know, sometimes employers can push a little too hard. And we have to be respectful. You know, look at the passage before there, the passage that Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. You know, we are, as Christians, we are supposed to be decent, moral, honorable employees for an employer. We are supposed to be honest, ethical. Employers shouldn't have to worry about Christians working for them. The Bible expects us to do a fair day's work for a fair day pay and to be honest and not defraud or cheat anybody. Sadly, a lot of people don't do that. And that's something that they're going to be held accountable for at the judgment. God expects us to be honored, uh, be honorable among all. But it's important that we realize, you know, where we work is where we're putting our treasure. Remember that uh, it's said in Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he made this statement about working for the Lord. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, some people ask, you know, well, how can I lay up treasures in heaven? I mean, how can I do that? It's a, you know, it's not a physical place. It, you know, I don't get a paycheck that says, you know, from heaven. You know, how do I do that exactly? I don't have a bank account per se. What's he mean? How do I lay up treasures in heaven? Well, you lay up treasures in heaven the same way you lay up treasures on the earth. You work for them, you labor for them, you sweat for them, you make time to do it. That's how you do it. And you're doing the Lord's work. You're working for the Lord. Let's take a look at this. You know, Jesus was a worker. In John chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. You know, Jesus had a work to do. He worked. You know, the, the man, you know, he worked all the time. And it's interesting to me, sometimes when it says that Jesus, you know, escaped from the multitude to be by himself. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's sort of telling. You know, we often, you know, the Bible actually records that he had to get away a little bit and, and take a break here or there. And I find it interesting that it, would say, that it would state that. He was working all the time. And he would point out the importance of work. And you think about, you know, the teachings of Jesus, and the parables that he gave. A lot of the parables he gave related to work and labor. And he talks a lot of the parables, he talks about you know, how we're supposed to work for the Lord, work for the church, work for the kingdom. And it, for example, the parable of the sower. Remember the parable of the sower? The sower went out to sow seed. What do you, what do you think he called that? That's work. That he's using a work metaphor to explain that spiritual truth. Or the parable of the lost sheep. Remember the, the sheep that gets away and the shepherd leaves the flock and he goes and he hunts that one sheep until he finds it and brings it back? Well, he's a shepherdman. He's working. Or the parable of the workers of the vineyard or the parable of the talents or the parable of the pound and others. You know, Jesus used the metaphor of work and working in everyday life to drive home to people the, the importance that, you know, you work for the Lord. Another one. You know, we're expected to be workers in the Lord's vineyard. Remember, that's one of the pictures that's made. We're workers in the vineyard. You know, we work. That's what we do. We're supposed to be working. We are to work. You know, the days are coming when we may not be able to work as much as we can today. And we need to keep that in mind. You know, we talk about that, how, you know, we work when, you know, in our, in our prime. And you know, we do the, the greatest amount of work. We're working to save for retirement. 
and we hope we have retirement. And tragically, you know, some people, they don't make it to retirement. They work their whole lives, and they get some dreaded disease, and they lose their life. And they, all that work will go to somebody else. And that's sad. That's tragic. That's awful. And we, we know, I'm sure you know of stories like that. I know people that's happened to. Or maybe they get all the way to the end of their career, and they get laid off. And they lose their pension or something like that. We all know stories like that. And that's tragic. But you need to make sure you're working for the Lord. If you're in your mind thinking, oh, you know, I'm 30 years old or I'm 20 years old or I'm, you know, 50, I'm going to get around to obeying the gospel. I'm going to get around to working for the church. I'm going to do volunteer work someday, someday, someday. And maybe you end up with cancer. And maybe it's not just that physical treasure you lose. You never get around to working in the vineyard. And you lose that too. Now that is not a pleasant picture. But it's a reality. And it's something that we need to face. The days are coming when we're not going to be able to work as much as we can today. And so we need to prepare while we can. You know, people work at various work statuses or classifications. Uh, for example, full-time, uh, part-time, temporary, semi-retired. Um, you know, we, we all recognize that. And, and ask yourself, you know, if you were to, you know, if you were a, wor you're a worker for the church, you're a worker for the kingdom, ask yourself, how would you classify yourself? Would you be full-time, part-time, temp, seasonal, once in a while, on call? How would you classify yourself? I was listening to a sermon uh, just recently by a man by the name of Michael Shepard, uh, and he was talking on his lesson was part-time members in a full-time church. And he made this statement, and I think it's very pointed. He says, you and I, as members of the New Testament church, we are to make our bodies available for the work of the church. That is what Paul is telling us here, brethren. I am to present my body. I don't sit down and wait on somebody to ask me to go to work. If you're doing that, of course, you are part-time. I am to make my body, my physical body, available for God's work. Nobody should have to ask us or beg us to do anything. And what he's referring to is Romans chapter 12, 9 through 13. And this is the passage that he was referring to. Uh, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another uh, with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer distributing to the needs of the saints and giving the hospitality. See, we're supposed to be workers now, not, you know, sometime later. And, and I can remember when I used to be a manager of a company, and I had, to, I had different, different type of status of employees working for me. I had people who were part-time, I had people who were full-time, and I had people that were temps. And, you know, and, and the temp employees were great, but, you know, you had to watch them sometimes because, you know, they're just here for the day. And, you know, and they're paid to be there from point, you know, time, tick of the clock to here to tick of the clock there. And if, and if I don't give them something to do, that's not their fault. I have to keep after it. I have to make sure they have plenty to do. I have to follow up with them, make sure they understand it. And the temporary employees I have, they're great. This is not a, a criticism of them. But, you know, some people don't do that. Some people say, well, I'll just sit around here and wait till my boss finally tells me to do something. And that's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude. Sadly, a lot of people treat the church the same way. I'm not going to do anything until somebody asks me to do something. And then when they ask them to do something, then they resent it. I'm sure you know employees that have been that way too. I, I'm saddened to say that I do too. You know, we need to keep in mind that you know, we receive repay, uh, retirement pay when we retire. And as Christians, we, we receive our retirement when we receive our rest. We don't get our pay until we go to our rest, and our rest is in heaven. In other words, we are working for the Lord all the time. And I'm not just talking about preachers. It's everybody. All Christians are supposed to be working for the church. You know, some people get in this idea, they think, well, you know, the preacher, he's the one that does the work, and we just, you know, we just sort of support him. Well, we're all supposed to be workers, and it's important that we remember that and keep that in mind. Look what it says in Luke 17, 7 through 10. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? 
But will he not rather say to him, prepare, your, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did these things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done what is our duty to do. In other words, no matter how much you do for the church, you're never going to be in a position where you say, that salvation is mine, God. You can't take it away from me. You know, I can just take the rest of my 10 years off because I've already done all this work. See all the work I've done? I've accumulated all this work, and, and now I can just sit back and do nothing. That's not the way the Bible treats it. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches the exact opposite. When we have done all that the Lord has told us to do, we're only saved by His grace. And we need to be those profitable servants, keeping the work, uh, working with Him. You know, we'll work till, you know, there's a song that we often sing that says, you know, we'll work in the song, the chorus of the song goes, uh, we'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. And the last line of the chorus is, then we'll be gathered home. And that song is so very true. Yeah, we need to realize that God works, and he expects us to work. Jesus works, and he expects us to work too. The Holy Spirit works, and he expects us to work. Now my question for you is, are you working? Are you working for the Lord? And that's something you need to ask yourself. Or how about this? Don't think that putting money in a collection plate or sending money in don't think that's a substitution for work. Everybody's supposed to give to the Lord's work. Everybody. So don't think, that, oh, you know what, if I just write a check, then I don't have to work. No, that doesn't work that way. No, we're supposed to work. Or going to church. You know, some people, they say, well, I attend services. There, I'm working. Well, no. So you go to church, you're there to worship the Lord. You're there to give. You're, you know, it's more than just, there's more to it than work. Or some people don't even go to church anymore. Sometimes you'll, you'll watch this program and think, well, here, I don't even go to church. I watch you on TV. I don't even have to go to church anymore. Well, that's false. You need to be going to church. And you need to be working in the church. You need to be working for the Lord. And if you're not doing that, and you can, you need to be doing that. Some people think that, you know, if I'm a part of an active church that's working, then I'm a worker. Well, maybe you're a part of an active church but maybe you're not working. You know, that's, it, you have to be a worker yourself. You know, when I worked as a temporary employee, I used to have to fill out a detailed timesheet. And I had to tell, you know, what time I came in, what time I went out. Sometimes they would ask me to list some of the tasks that I had completed for them during that time. And ask yourself, if you had to fill out a timesheet like that and give it to the Lord to expect pay, what would you have on that sheet? How much time? Now, I realize that you, know, you work a full-time job, and you have a family, or you have other obligations. I understand that. But if it's blank day after day after day, and days turns into weeks, and weeks turns into months, and years, they stack up quickly. Don't let too much time get away from you. I talk to a lot of people, elderly people, they're great. I encourage you to talk to, to older people. They're fantastic. I enjoy visiting with them at uh, altar care in different places or nursing homes and other places I've been. And I, and I talk to people who are 95 years old. You know, when I go to them, all the people I've talked to, I have never had one of them say, well, I finally made it to 95 years old. I didn't think I'd ever get here. It took forever. No, what I hear is, I can't believe I'm 95 years old. My whole life just went Phew, and it was gone. It was gone. When you reach your older years, work today while you can for the Lord. Thank you very much for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. 
don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. In this world we have our troubles. Satan scarcely must be there.